Okay, today, biblical interpretation. You know, you guys are in your second week and you came back. That's good. Um, the outline for the class, which um, you got in the materials last week if you picked up those sheets. If anybody didn't get the reading schedule, I've got like three of them up here. So let me know if you don't have the reading schedule. Um, today, starting with the text, next week, next week, questions of meaning, then principles of interpretation, one and two, interpreting the New Testament, interpreting the Old Testament, and then applying the overall principles. So that's where we're going. First, let me ask you, did you have any questions from your reading for the week? You understand the basic, the, the way that the author is laying this out for you, and I, 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 Duval and uh, Hayes, I never remember the second guy's name, is he's making it like a journey. That when you are studying a passage of scripture, interpreting it, you think of the village where the writer and the, and the people who received it originally lived, the river that separates, in other words, how are we not like them? What are what is the bridge, the principles that connect us, theological principles that are consistent from 2,000 years ago to today or 3,500 years ago to today? You know, what are those principles that cross over? And then what town do we live in? In other words, what is our particular uh, context and circumstance to which we need to apply those principles? Um, it's a good outline. It's consistent with, you know, I gave you a couple of different ways of thinking about this and going through the process last week, and they are all basically approaches to the same thing, and that is understanding the original setting for a text, understanding what the key meaning, theological meaning is, understanding how we're different than those people and how, how we dis apply this to our lives. Um, and along the way, there's other kinds of particular contexts you need to ask about. You need to look at the context of the overall book of the Bible and of the Bible as a whole, things like that. But we're going to get into a little bit today starting with the text, and some of what I'm going to do uh, here is to talk about kind of the some of the underlying principles behind biblical interpretation, like what we believe about uh, inspiration, you know, what was God's part in this book versus the human writer's part, the issues of inerrancy, infallibility, things like that. So we'll get into several, several of those things today. Um, but no questions from your reading. Are you all doing all right with it? Had somebody say there's, you know, a lot of new words and there's a lot of material. The only way to learn this stuff is to expose yourself to it. And the first time you're exposed to it, it's going to seem very foreign to you. And yet, this is important stuff. In fact, this is the most important thing in your life. Long pause. Because the most important thing in your life is your relationship with Jesus. And the only way you can, you can experience Jesus initially is in, in God's Word. And so, this is training you how to get into it and, and experience it and interpret it and understand it so that it will apply to your spiritual life, your walk with Jesus, okay? So it is, it is critically important. If, if um, a study was done not too long ago and 90% of all uh, Christians were asked what the biggest priority for them was, and that was to grow closer to Jesus and become more like Him. And then they asked, how many of you read the Bible every day? And these were committed church-attending Christians, and 19% of them said they read the Bible every day. So 90% want to be more like Jesus, but 19, only 19% are actually going to the place where they learn about Jesus. Do we see an inconsistency there? And so um, I think that we really need to be aware. Yeah, an, another survey that was done by um, Willow Creek Church. They did a survey all across the United States, churches, a thousand churches, 250,000 people responded to the study, and they were trying to identify, <clears throat> identify with people at different stages in their Christian walk, whether they're seekers, they're not yet believers even, whether they're young Christians, whether they're sort of middle of the road, or whether they're very mature, committed Christians, and they were trying to find out in each of those kind of categories what are the most important factors and helping someone grow in maturity for wherever they are, so that you know a, a new Christian grows to the place where they're sort of a, a, a mainstream uh, Christian who understands the basics of the faith, and then from there on to becoming a mature Christian. At every level, considering things like attending church and hearing sermons, going to Sunday school <coughs> class, um, attending inspirational conferences, listening to Christian music, and on and on and on. All, anything you can think of that would affect a person's Christian walk, the number one factor in every category, from seeker to very mature Christian, was the Word of God. 
whether or not they were studying the Bible, whether they were not bringing the Bible into themselves and then applying the Bible in their lives in an external way, that was in every case, in every category, the most significant thing to somebody growing in maturity as a Christian. You know, I, I've preached on this, and to me it's astonishing that people will say, um, well, you know, I really needed God, and, and when I asked Him, He wasn't there for me. And I'm sure God is saying, all of those times when you weren't in crisis, did you bother to come to me then? Did you bother to approach me through my revelation to you? Did you go to the Word to learn more about me? To spend time in fellowship with me through the message I gave you? Most people are ridiculous in that they never want to give anything to God, but they got, expect God to give everything to them. And the primary way we need to commit ourselves to God and give ourselves to our relationship with Him is by studying His Word. That's why He gave it to us. Okay, I'll start preaching here. I guess our, uh, But you get the idea. That's why this is critically important. Now, we have other, other courses, if you want to go back and watch the videos, on how to study the Bible, New Testament survey, Old Testament survey, all that kind of stuff. But this class is more a class on how to interpret the Bible for yourself, but especially to be able to do that so that you can then share it with others through teaching, you know, a Bible study class, giving a devotional, whatever. I'm going to get into some of that today. Um, and so the interpretation question comes into it. <coughs> Our mandate from Scripture, I shared this last week, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. The word of truth is Scripture. It's God's revelation to us in the Bible. Okay? Um, Jesus is also called the Word. And I've had people say, you know, the Bible is God's great, God, great revelation, revelation to us. And, and I've had people say, well, what about Jesus? He's the great revelation to us. And I say, yes. And where do you learn about Jesus? Where do you go for that message? Where have people gone for that message ever since the, the death of Jesus and the apostles? Uh, after the, the death of the last first person witness to Jesus, we go to the written word. You want to find Jesus, that's where we go. Um, and so... That's why I believe when we say the word of truth, the word, the word is Jesus, but we find Jesus in the word, which is the written word. Okay? You'll, ask, you'll stop me if you have questions. Okay? Um, just uh, These first few slides are catching up from where we were, were last week. We've talked about exegesis, which is a critical explanation or interpretation of a text. And when we say critical, we don't mean negative. A critical interpretation means that you're just paying attention and you're really trying to understand it in a, an objective kind of way. Critical means objective. And it is the best synonym for it when it's used in this, in this way. Critical can be positive. A critical evaluation can be a positive thing. Um, you know, a, a, a movie critic can say, this is the greatest movie I ever saw. He's still a critic, even if everything was positive about it. So uh, exegesis, a critical explanation or interpretation of the text, particularly religious text, you can apply exegesis and hermeneutics to secular things as well, but that's not usually how these words are used. Hermeneutics is the theory of textual interpretation, especially interpretation of Bible text. And then hermeneutics and exegesis sometimes are used interchangeably. Hermeneutics is the larger discipline. The way I like to think about them is exegesis is, is taking the, the scripture and saying, what does it say? You know, which means... <coughs> You get into textual criticism, things I'm going to talk about today. But what does it say, and how are we sure that's accurate? And then hermeneutics is, what does it mean? What do we do with it once we figure out what it says? So for me, that's how those words are used. I will most often in this class, from, from now on, just use the word hermeneutics, or biblical interpretation, which is another way of saying the same thing. But exegesis, think of it in terms of what the, the, the discipline and process of figuring out what does Scripture say, Hermeneutics is what does it mean and how do we apply it to our lives, okay? Um, so, why? Why do we need to do this? I mean, I've already preached a sermon on that this morning, the last 10 minutes. But um, what is the need for biblical knowledge, biblical exposure? Um, there are a number of things that Scripture does for Christians. Now, they... Scripture does this for us in the context of the Holy Spirit acting, because the Holy Spirit speaks through Scripture. Um, and so, as I'm talking about this, you'll notice I say what it does for Christians. For somebody who's not a believer, who does not have the Holy Spirit speaking to their life, the Holy Spirit's message to an unbeliever is, is the, the, 
the message you hear about Jesus is true. But all of these things are related to those who have the Holy Spirit because they are Christians, and the Holy Spirit uses, uh, uses Scripture to do these things. First, conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit applies God's Word to the human heart and convicts us when we fail to meet God's holy standard. You know, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sin. But the primary way He does it is by showing us in Scripture what we ought not do and what we ought do. And giving us a clear picture of where we fall in that spectrum. And so the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to convict the human heart through Scripture. Second is correction and instruction. This is related to conviction. Once the Holy Spirit tells us there's something wrong, and some, most of you have heard me say this before, um, I used the word conviction about 12 times in the last two minutes. Conviction is a Christian or religious word. The secular uh, version of that word is guilt. And people are always saying, oh, we don't want people to feel guilty. And my response is, well, why not? As long as that guilt is coming from the Holy Spirit, not from me. It's not my job to lay guilt on people, but it's also not my job. If somebody hears a sermon or a teaching or anything else, or reads something in, in Scripture, and they are feeling the conviction, or guilt, to use the secular word, that something is wrong in their life, who am I to try to make, take that away from them, make them feel like that's okay? The Holy Spirit may be the one speaking to them about that. And so when we talk about conviction of sin, that's feeling as though something's not right. That's guilt. Godly guilt. And then correction and instruction is when the Holy Spirit tells us what ought we to do about it, um, that we need to change, and here is the way in which we need to change. Um, the Bible is well described as doing three things. It teaches us about God, it teaches us about ourselves, and then it teaches us how we're supposed to relate to God, what God expects of us, and how we're supposed to relate to Him. In fact, any preaching or teaching message that you ever do in any context <coughs> needs to be that. We need to recognize, we need to talk about God, we need to talk about us and our situation, and then how those things fit together. The mistake that most preachers in the world make, I think, is they'll only talk about God, and the people in the congregation will be sitting there thinking, well, okay, but what does that have to do with me? Let's go get lunch. Or, in more liberal veins, they'll talk only about the people and their needs and their concerns and their, you know, and never bring God into it. Um, Carolyn and I were down here once, and we went to an Easter service in which the, uh, this church didn't exist then, in which the minister at that church preached an Easter morning service and never mentioned Jesus. Not one time. Everything was about us and what we experience and our potential and what we can become. Right, Carolyn? Um, and God was nowhere. Nowhere to be found in that sermon. And so we have to, it's about God, but it's also about us, and it's about how we and God are to relate, what God expects of us and how we're supposed to respond. Fair? And that's part of the con correction and instruction. God, the Holy Spirit also uses Scripture to bring us to spiritual fruitfulness, to produce a harvest of righteousness, um, that we can grow in love for God because of spending time in Scripture. And we then can begin to see the fruit of that relationship with God proceeding. Uh, through Scripture, God gives us perseverance. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, believers can, can hear and then hold fast to the message through trials and temptations and difficulties in life. If you are, if you are immersed in Scripture, you are far less likely to be blown about by the temptations and difficulties in life and less likely to give in to them because you have the encouragement uh, and strength that comes from Scripture by the Holy Spirit. There is also joy and delight. The, the Bible, and I know for people who aren't into Bible reading, who don't get it, who don't understand this, um, to say that the Bible is a source of joy and delight would sound ridiculous to them. I recently read a story, an illustration that D.L. Moody, the great preacher from Chicago, uh, used. He said there was a woman who um, once picked up a book and started reading it, and she didn't care for it. She got a couple chapters in and she said, eh, it's not for me, and she set it aside. Well, just a few weeks later, she met, through a group of friends, she met the man who wrote that book. And she got to know him. And they started seeing each other, they fell in love, they got married, and she went back and read that book, and all of a sudden, it was the most interesting book she had read. <laughs> because having a relationship with the author 
gives you a very different perspective on the book that author wrote. And so if you have a relationship with Jesus and you understand that it is God himself, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we're responsible for this book being produced, then all of a sudden your, your idea about this book and what it does for you is going to be very, very different. Most people who, and if you're one of the people who you pick up the Bible and go, this is the driest, most boring thing ever, take a step back and say, Lord, is this a reflection of my relationship with you? I'm not, I'm not beating you up here. I'm just saying you need to ask that question. Am I having trouble relating to this book because I'm having trouble relating to the author? Um, that's a question to ask. And then finally, on this list, the Bible becomes our ultimate authority in doctrine and deed. Scripture tells us what, what the Christian belief is. It tells us what our behavior should be. It, it allows us to evaluate whether what we hear is correct in terms of preaching and doctrines and opinions and creed. Um, when we get into discussions of, of topics, society today, and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here or specifics, but society today clearly is saying things are okay that the, the, any, any kind of objective reading of Scripture is saying not okay. And so at a certain point, we have to say, you know, it doesn't matter what other people say, and it doesn't matter what I really would prefer, because I have a doc, I have a book, what mine in there, uh, that is from God Himself that tells me what I'm supposed to believe about this and how I'm supposed to act about this. There is an objective standard of correct doctrine and deed that we have to look to, and we can't just set that aside when it says something we don't like. That objectivity means, I mean, if somebody challenged me because I said it's not okay for a man and woman who aren't married to, you know, to live as husband and wife, and they'd say, well, you know, what, they'd say, well, what kind of dark ages are you living in? You know, get with, I'd say, it's not me. I'm not the one who says that. It's in the book. And this is the book on which our faith, my faith, is founded. So there's an objective reference, a, a great illustration that Carolyn's mother I'm pointing to Carolyn a lot today. When Carolyn was a little girl, she lived in Wisconsin, where it's cold. And on a given day, it would be, you know, it, it seemed cold, and her mother would say, okay, you have to wear a jacket today. And they and they say, we don't want to, she or her siblings would say, we don't want to wear a jacket. And her mother would say, well, what does the thermometer say? If the thermometer was below a certain level, you had to wear a sweater. And if it was below, you know, well below that, below a certain level, then you had to wear a jacket. And so her mother could say objectively, don't ask me, what does the thermometer say? <laughs> And if the thermometer was below a certain level, you had to wear a sweater. Below a certain other level, you had to wear a jacket. That was just a given. There was no discussion. Well, there's an extent to which the Bible is the thermometer for us. In which we say, it, it, it's, you know, you can argue with me all you want to. It's not me. This is what the canon says. The canon literally means yardstick. The yardstick of Scripture. And if, if I'm going to keep my faith, not forsake my whole faith, then I have to look to that as the guide. Right. Another example. <clears throat> when I was an industrial engineer, my job was to <coughs> study people to see if they were working at what we perceived. An efficiency expert. Yes, an efficiency expert. Yes. But in order to do that, I had to study what was normal. Mm -hmm. They showed us film after film after film, and we had all kinds of exercises to know what the standard was in order to apply that to you, right. whether you were working at 90% or 100% or 120%. So that, that's always stayed with me when you talk about the authority of God and being the standard. Yeah. yeah we, are not, we are not adrift to just make stuff up by ourselves. Yep, there is a standard. I actually, I had the lead in um, Cheaper by the Dozen. Yeah. Gilbert, the father, is an efficiency expert. He teaches them how to take a bath in like 30 seconds. But, um, <laughs> not to hear it there, but it's a great play if you ever have a chance to see Cheaper by the Dozen. Um, one of the things, and let me say this, when we talk about biblical interpretation, to start any kind of effective study of the Bible, um, I believe you, an interpretation of the Bible, I believe you have to have a basic understanding of the Bible. Some people, you know, they become a Christian or they've been a Christian and they decide they're going to get serious about Bible study, and they think that they're going to take John 1 and spend the next nine years focusing on John 1, and they don't have a clue about the, the simplest idea of what the whole Bible is, what's in it, what the story is, 
or the context for any of that. Remember context, we've talked about it, we'll get into that more um, in the next few weeks. Um, I think that in addition to Bible study, in terms of specific passage or text, we should all start <coughs> excuse me, with a larger sense of what the Bible is, what, you know, what's in it, and what the story is. Because it will make a huge difference in terms of your understanding of a specific thing you read. So I'm going to spend a little bit now talking about what's in the Bible and what the story is. And if you know this, then it's good for you to hear it again. If you don't, then it gives you an opportunity to recognize where you need to go. Um, this is the structure of the Bible. I took this from a cover of a, a, a sort of Bible commentary survey book. Um, the whole Bible is 66 books. It is broken down, about three quarters of it is the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. I'm talking about Testament in a minute. Um, uh, 39 of those books, now this is in the English version. There are fewer books in the Hebrew Bible, that is the Hebrew version, uh, because it's the same material, but it's in different order and it's broken up differently. For instance, we have First and Second Kings, that's one book in the Hebrew Bible. First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, each of those is one book. The 12 Minor Prophets in the English Bible is one book in the Hebrew Bible. It's called the Book of the Twelve. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. So they end up with, I think it's 26 instead of 39 books. Um, fewer than that, like 24, I guess. But it's the same stuff. It's in a different order, and it's gathered differently, but it's the same material. Okay. Um, so, and then well, about one quarter of the book is the New Testament, 27 books. Uh, the Old Testament, again in the English version, is broken up into law, history, wisdom, and prophecy. These are the books. In the New Testament, Gospel and Acts, uh, some, some, and I'm going to break this up for you specifically, Gospel versus Acts, usually is the way it's done. Uh, there's four Gospels, one book of Acts. There are the book of letters, there's uh, the Pauline letters, which goes down through Philemon. Then there are the general epistles, and then the book of Revelation, which is a category all by itself, because there's nothing quite like the book of Revelation. <laughs> Okay, um, you need to understand that. Ideally, to be able to memorize it. For no other reason than if you're reading something and it refers to the fourth chapter of Zechariah, how long is it going to take you to find it? Okay, I, I mean, I don't immediately go, there it is. In fact, in the Baptist churches, they used to have sword drills, they were called, in which all these kids would be there with their Bibles closed. And then, usually the preacher or somebody would, would give them a passage, you know, uh, Haggai 9.12. And they I don't even think there are nine chapters in Haggai. But they, they you know, and the kids would uh, see who could get to it fastest and read it. And that's how they taught the kids to um, know where the books are. Uh, but you really should, and, and every once in a while, I'm, I confess, I'll go, let's see, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, is he, okay, then that's where it is. I have to think through it. I do the same thing with the multiplication table, okay, you know, what's, uh, and 8 times 9, well, 8 times 8 is 64, is 73, okay, I sometimes have to do a 72, in, uh, or 72, <laughs> <laughs> well, according to my multiplication table, so that's what a liberal interpreter would say, well, my multiplication table is different, no, um, so, these are the basic divisions. Now, Old Testament and New Testament. Some people miss the importance of the word testament. The word testament literally means covenant or agreement. So, when we talk about the Old Testament, we mean the old covenant between God and His people. The New Testament is the new covenant. Now, it's really a continuum, and I won't get into this whole topic, but the issue that some people think the Old Testament God, you know, God was judgmental and, you know, uh, legalistic and really uh, awful in the Old Testament. And then, New Testament's all sweetness and light, mercy and grace. It's not at all. God acts basically the same way through the Old Testament. New Testament, He gives us more grace in the New Testament. The Old Testament is the story over and over and over again of God telling the people what He desired of them and what was required. And they do it for a little while, and then they would violate, you know, completely violate the agreement. And God would punish them but then he would take them back. And it would happen in that same cycle. You know, God would tell them what to do, they'd do it for a while, then they would violate their relationship with God, God would punish them, and then he'd take them back. That taking them back thing, which happens over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament, is a clear indication that the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. All right? um, but you need to know some of 
where everything is and how that flows. And, and one way you can do it is by understanding the different kinds of books that are in the, the Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, <coughs> 39 individual books varying in literary genre from historical narrative to romantic poetry. The books of the Old Testament were basically been written over a thousand year period. The earliest of them is generally believed to be the five books of Moses. Um, I'll show you in a second. Uh, some people think that Job may actually be the oldest book in, in the Old Testament, that it may have been written earlier even than, than Moses is writing. But those 39 individual books over a thousand years, assuming that Moses wrote the first five books somewhere in the 1400s, Malachi, the last of the prophets, was written around 430, so you get that range. The first five books, and to the Jews, the most important of the books, uh, there have been some sects of Judaism, like the Sadducees in the New Testament, they believe that the law of Moses, the first five books, were all that was actually mandatory. The rest of it is just commentary. But uh, most Jews believe that the first five books of law, um, the, the word is Torah. Torah, you've heard Torah. The, a better interpretation for Torah is instruction. But it is instruction or law. The traditional belief, my belief, is that Moses wrote those five books. In Greek, it is sometimes called the Pentateuch. Pentateuch means five books, or the five-part book, you can interpret it as. So those first five, they tell the origin of the world, the beginning of the nation of Israel, how God chose Israel, um, the giving of his law, etc. The first 11 chapters are the prehistoric prequel that have four great events. There is the creation, the fall, um, the flood and the Tower of Babel. And then at the end of chapter 11, start of chapter 12, we get introduced to Abraham. And then it becomes a much more historical in terms of the sequence of events in people's lives. Um, activity in Genesis and then Exodus is the departure from Egypt and all of that. Um, you need to know that. In fact, if you take the survey classes, one of the things that, that is on the, what you need to know from this class and is on the test is a basic idea about what, the, what at least the major books, what their focus is, what are they about? You know, what is the book? What are the two great events in the book of Exodus? The departure from Egypt, from slavery in Egypt by the Israelites, and the giving of the law. And everything else is revolving around those two big events. You need to understand things like that. I'm not going to teach you to, that to you today, but you need to set that as a goal for yourself. You know, what is Deuteronomy? Well, the very word Deuteronomy means a second law or the second telling of the law. Whereas Exodus was where the Ten Commandments were given, and all the other 603 commandments, there's 613 mitzvah, or commandments in the, in the Old Testament. Um, Deuteronomy, they go back and rehearse the law again, they go through it again, so that the next generation, after all of the first the adults that had been in the Exodus died, before they went into the Promised Land, Deuteronomy tells them all again what the law is. You need to understand that. Because without understanding basically what the stream is, what the general flow of events are, what the major points of historical importance are, you're going to have trouble interpreting much of anything. Second, the historical books. And again, this is the English version uh, of uh, or, or organization uh, from Joshua to Esther. From the entering of the Promised Land to the Persian, um, to Esther being in Persia after the Persians defeated the Babylonians. And, you know, do you know why the Assyrians are important to Old Testament? Do you know why the Babylonians are important? Do you know why the Persians are important? You should. Wisdom and Psalms. There are five books in this. Uh, it's Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, some people know that. There are the major prophets. There are five of those. Isaiah, Dan uh, Isaiah Jeremiah, uh, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And they're called major prophets only because they're longer. Not because they're more important. You know, some of these are the biggest books in the Bible. Um, and then we have the minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi, or what the Hebrew Bible calls the Book of the Twelve. Now, the Hebrew Bible is broken up differently, as I said, and it has three big sections. The first one is the same as the, the law, the five books, the Torah, the five books of Moses. The second Hebrew section is called the Ketuvim, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the Nevi'im, i to get them on order, the Nevi'im, which means the prophets. They include Joshua as a prophet, because prophet is defined as anyone who represents God, who presents God's word, and is a leader appointed by God. So uh, the prophets is a much bigger section than what we think of. 
And then the Ketuvim is the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the, the poetry, that sort of thing. Those three titles, those three sections in Hebrew, the Torah, the uh, Nevaim and Ketuvim, that is the law, the prophets, and the writings, those three words get squunched together. In Hebrew, it's a big deal. They often make, make words out of the first letter or two of the other words, sort of like acronyms. They call the Bible in Hebrew the Tanakh, from Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. Tanakh. That's the name the Hebrew, uh, the Jewish people have for the Hebrew Bible. Um, then we get to the New Testament. And by the way, the Old Testament is God's word to us as well. Anybody, you, if you ever meet anybody who doesn't believe in teaching or preaching from the, the Old Testament, smack them upside the head and rebuke them. Because all of this is God's word to us. We cannot understand fully or appreciate fully the New Testament without the context of the Old Testament. You know, it's not that that was done away with. Jesus said, I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And so you can't understand fulfillment unless you understand the setup that occurs in the Old Testament. So the New Testament is um, first the Gospels, the four Gospels, and though the Gospels are broken up in two kinds, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic means same seeing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in terms of, uh, they have different perspectives on things, uh, but they have a lot of the same information, and it, they're much more what we would understand as kind of a historical telling, not truly history as we understand it, because that wasn't invented, uh, you know, uh, in the Hebrew people at least, that didn't exist in the same way. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then the theological gospel, which is more concerned about telling us not what happened, but what it meant, is John. And that's true because John wrote his gospel many, many, many years after the first three, when the first three were available already in circulation. In all likelihood, the way I picture it is the Christians um, later in the first century, because John lived some to, somewhere between AD 90 and 100. He lived to be quite old, the only apostle that died a natural death. Um, I, it's like everybody else said, well, John, you know, the great the great apostle John who was still alive. We've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts, but sometimes we have trouble understanding what it really means. Can you help explain it to us so that we know more what happened, more than what happened, but what it, what's important about it? And so John wrote a version that is much more theological, much more about what it means rather than what it says, because he wrote it many years after the first three were written. The Acts of the Apostles, which is the story written by Luke, the same man who wrote the uh, Gospel of Luke, and the only Gentile writer of any part of the Bible. All other writers are Jewish men. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles is the story of the, the founding and the growing of the church after the resurrection, and, or after the ascension of Jesus. It starts with Jesus' ascension, and then in the second chapter, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We then have the Pauline Epistles, 13 of them, Romans through Philemon. They are in order of length. Just like um, you know, some of the, the Old Testament, the, the major prophets come first because they're longer. So these are in order of length, Romans being the longest Pauline epistle. I don't know who decided to do that, to put them in order of length instead of in order of chronological order, but they did. And it's not likely we're going to change all the Bibles in the world now, because this is the order everyone knows. Um, it, the exception to that is that where a letter was written, two letters were written to either a place or a person like 1st and 2nd Corinthians or 1st and 2nd Timothy, those two are kept together. So that length, it, it doesn't hold there. Philemon being the shortest of it. We then have the general epistles. There are eight of those. Uh, Hebrew, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. They, Hebrews, for a long time in the early church, was thought to have been written by, uh, by Paul. Well, it wasn't. It's, a not, it's a, the only anonymous book in the New Testament. Um, the, the style of writing, the vocabulary, everything about it demonstrates that it's not Pauline. Paul didn't write it. That doesn't mean it's not Pauline. <clears throat> My personal opinion is that it was written by Priscilla, of Priscilla and Aquila, because the only other reason, that, you know, I can't think of another good reason why they would not have known who the author was unless people didn't want to talk about it. And so Priscilla is acknowledged as being a great teacher in Paul's writing. So, um, and Carolyn's mother, thought it was written by Priscilla, yeah. and so that's pretty much same as far as I'm concerned. And James, Peter, and John are identified by Paul as being the pillars of the church in that order. And so that's why they're put in that order in the Bible, James, Peter, and John. And then Jude was a half-brother of Jesus. 
James, the uh, head of the Jerusalem Council, James the Just, and Jude were both half-brothers of Jesus. Children of Mary. Sorry, Catholic folks, if there are Catholics here. But Protestant belief is that Mary had other children, that she was not married ever virgin, as the Catholics would say. Okay? Um, and then the book of Revelation, John's vision, his apocalyptic vision. In fact, the word apocalypse, which people think means, oh, everything is blowing up, the world is ending. Apocalypse means revelation. Something that is revealed. That's what that word in Greek means. So this is the New Testament. Um, and you may be thinking, why are we doing this in biblical interpretation class? Because I absolutely believe that we have to know what's in there and what the storyline is before we can be serious about being able to accurately interpret it. Now, the, the, the stuff that was written in the Bible originally did not have chapter divisions and it did not have verse divisions. The chapter divisions were first added uh, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose name was Stephen Langdon, in the end of the um, 12th century. And it became so popular. It used to be that the only thing they could say is, well, you know, about midway through the book of Galatians, there's a story about. You know, now they can say Galatians 4. Well, so in the, in the 12th century, and, and now there's some really awkward places where that the breaks are made, and you're thinking, okay, why did he do that? Um, so that's why you can't pay too much attention to those chapter breaks. That was not part of the inspired written thing. It was put in later to make it easier for us to study. Um, then the verse divisions were actually, there were Old Testament verse divisions written about AD 900 for the Hebrew Bible. But then in the 1500s, a printer from Paris named uh, Robert Stephanus Estienne added the verse Divisions. And again, sometimes those verses break in out of places, but that's the standard now, and it's not likely anybody's going to go back and change it. In fact, the, some of the Hebrew scholars went back and adapted their verse divisions to what the, the New Testament, uh, or the, the SDN, did in the 1500s, so that it's consistent. Um, and people who try to assign some kind of mystical, mystical numerological thing to what verses occur where, etc., etc., Come on, people. You know, that's not part of God's inspired word. It was added later by people, and we're grateful for that because it makes it easier for us. If I, if I say go to Psalm 119, verse 37, you can find it. If I said, you know, go to a little bit past the middle of the book of Psalms, and, and you're going to go, what? If you didn't have chapter and you didn't have verse, then this would be a much harder deal. Even Jesus, uh, for instance, at one point he's referring to the burning bush. Uh, event. They didn't have chapter and verse at that point. So Jesus said, you know, in the story of the burning bush, because he couldn't refer to it by chapter and verse. Right? Well, if, you, if that's all you had and you had to look for that, uh, you'd have to know it was Exodus and you'd have to know it was early in Exodus. Questions about any of that? Do you understand why I'm going through all this stuff? I think this is important for a basis. The other thing you need to learn, other than what's in it, is what is the story? And I'm going to do this very quickly. Uh, we have the prehistoric prequel, which has the four events I mentioned. It's the, it's the creation, the fall, um, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. So, for instance, we have Adam and Eve and Noah. And the dating on that is LTA. This is a very technical word, you'll learn. It means a uh, long time ago. <laughs> because we don't know for sure. Right? Unless you're a young earth creationist, then you believe you can date that to 6,000 years ago or whatever. Um, I don't think we can. We believe the call of Abraham was about 2000 BC. That was the start of the, uh, as I say, the end of the 11th, start of the 12th chapter of Genesis, and that's where the story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Jacob's sons, who became the 12, um, the 12, patri the 12 patriarchs, or the, the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. The Exodus, where Moses comes into it, and, and here's another thing you need to understand. The three great characters around which almost everything else is built, almost, in the Old Testament are Abraham, Moses, and David. Abraham was the father of the people of Israel. Okay, he is the patriarch, the one who started it, biologically started the people. The second great figure is Moses. He was the one that God called to bring them up out of Egypt and to give them the law. The religion of Judaism did not start with Abraham. The people did, but the religion started with Moses. Because prior to their being, I mean, God had called the people and said, follow me. But the only thing they had that made them theologically different at that point was circumcision. 
and the fact they believed in only one God. Moses was given the law. So the religion of Judaism started with Moses after the Exodus. We believe that was in the 1400s. And that's when the first books of the Bible, the first five books of Moses, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were written. Again, there is some, some reason to believe that Job may be even older, at least an older tradition. That's okay. It's not a problem. So, and the third person, Abraham, Moses, the third person is David. David was the great king, not the first king, but the great king, the one that really made them a nation. So you have Abraham, the biological father of the people. You have Moses, the founder of the religion by God's direction, and David, the one that made them a nation. Those are the three most critical figures in the Old Testament. And as I, I've often said, if you want to remember a basic timeline, think Abraham 2000, Rough, this is very rough, but it gives you something to hang it on. Abraham 2000, Moses around 1500, David 1000. So every 500 years between 2000 and 1000, you've got one of those three major characters. Does that help? You know, so that it's easy to remember. <clears throat> the monarchy begins, God chooses Saul, but he's not the one that really makes it happen. King David, around 1010, becomes king. Um, we then have the divided kingdom, that's after Solomon's death, because Solomon had allowed his wives to encourage the worship of other gods, including child sacrifice and stuff like that. Then God splits the kingdom because of Solomon's disobedience into Israel, the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. The Assyrian exile, the destruction of Samaria, which means the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722. The Babylonian exile, where the southern kingdom of Judah was taken captive, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed. Um, and a lot of dating and things have to do with uh, historical events, how we know when things happen. The Persian period, after only about 50 years or so, the Persians defeated the Babylonians, and Cyrus, the king of Persia, allowed the Jews to go back home. And that's where you get Ezra and Nehemiah going back to the city and rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the wall and all of that. Um, the second temple is finished. That is, you know, the, the first temple was the Temple of Solomon. It had been destroyed by the Babylonians. The second temple was built by Herod. Um, so, um, well, the second temple was built um, before Herod. He came along later and simply updated it. The first temple was built, built by Zerubbabel. But even scripture says it's a pretty sorry building. You know, they said, compare this to the old one and you don't even talk about it. So that's when the second temple was finished. But then, and then Malachi is the last Old Testament uh, prophet in the Old Testament book. We then have about 400 years where God did not speak through a prophet, the intertestamental period, the time of the Maccabees, where the Jewish family, the Maccabean family, the Hasmoneans, they were called, where they defeated the Seleucid. Um, Seleucus had been one of the generals of, of Alexander the Great. You guys who came to the Alexander talk. Seleucus founded a, a, a kingdom, the Seleucid Empire, and the Seleucids were controlling uh, Israel, Palestine during that time, and the Jews rose up and beat them off because they were doing all sorts of things against the Jewish faith. Um, and that happened during the time when there were no prophets. Jesus is born sometime around 7 to 4 BC. I usually say 6. Jesus' ministry uh, of about 30 years, uh, up until AD 27 to 30, again, depending upon, um, or 33 years, depending upon when you have him born. That's when the, that's when the difference is. His crucifixion sometime around AD 30. The first New Testament books, which were the books of Paul, probably Galatians, maybe James, you know, comes in there fairly early. Uh, one of those two were probably first, written about AD 45, so within about 15 years of Jesus' death. And people always say, well, why did they wait so long to write these books? Well, two reasons. One, they thought Jesus was coming back right away. So they didn't see the need to take the time to write this down. They were out telling people about it in person. And secondly, after 15 years and more, because some of the other writing, they began to see that so many Christians were being persecuted and killed. There was a danger that the people who were first-hand witnesses might die out. They might be killed off. And then so in order to make sure that the witness didn't go away, they began to write down what they'd experienced so that other people could read it even if they got killed. Um, and then... The last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, written sometime around 8090 to 8100, you know, toward the end of John's life. That's the story. And you guys need to know that story. You need to be able to describe that so that you understand the context in which everything else happens. This is the larger conflict, context of the story of the Bible. All right? Any questions about that? Oh, it's just a comment that is excellent. <coughs> it really 
puts everything kind of together. Good. And I mean, there's obviously a lot of stuff in between there, the various prophets and all that kind of stuff. But these, these are the high points, right? What do you think about the chronological Bible? Well, they're fine, except I don't know that you gain a whole lot. And I say that in terms of, uh, Carolyn's been reading through a chronological Bible for the last year or so, and, and I don't, would you comment on what your experience of it's been? Well, I think it does kind of help with context, because you read a book like um, Isaiah that <laughs> covers a kajillion years, and, and you don't necessarily know what's going on. Right. It, when it, they divided it out so that it's, it, all these different passages kind of relate to, to things. Right. So it, I, think, I think it's helpful. I don't know that it's necessary. But yeah, it, it I mean, it may, it may be one tool. Uh, yeah. there, there is some advantage, perhaps, like when you read the letters of Paul. If you start with Galatians, don't start with Romans. Galatia, uh, Paul's theology developed over time. It got, it got more detailed. It got more sophisticated. Now, it doesn't mean it changed. It's just, <clears throat> you know, a child who starts out in elementary school, by the time they get to college, they can tell you the same story, but it's going to have more details. It's going to have more you know, specific content. Well, Paul's theology, when he wrote the first book, Galatians, AD 45, was still very simple. And that doesn't mean it was wrong. It doesn't mean it was bad. It's just, and that's what it was called for. By the time he got to writing the book of Romans, which was much later, um, well, much later, almost 20 years later, um, then Paul had had more time to think about it, more time to pray about it, more time for God to give him insight into things, more situations he had to consider and deal with from the context. And so it's a much more involved, complete theologically, um, you know, the theological aspect of it is much more. And in that regard, reading Paul's letters, for instance, in chronological order, there is some good sense to that. Okay? Um, so now we get into... I have one, yes. one question out of the epistles of Paul, some things I did there, or uh, learned there. Um, it said that some of his books, he didn't actually write, that somebody else did the writing. Mm -hmm. he, he dictated or gave. Right. Is, that, is that ever explained in any of the other books? Or? Well, it isn't Paul. I mean, um, he names his secretary. In Greek, the word is amenuensis. And right. Paul, like almost everybody, he had people who traveled with him, and he dictated them. Not just Paul, others as well. well that's the others I'm learning about. Right? Yeah. Some of these go back, I guess we wouldn't know. Well, um, we know for a fact that, it, um, <coughs> we know, that it just fled my mind, uh, John's amenuensis, in fact, if you go to Patmos, where the book of Revelation was written, the cave where he traditionally wrote that, um, there's a mosaic over the door of Paul, or of John, excuse me, of John, dictating that to a young, much younger man who's writing. Okay. So it's widely understood that it was dictated and then written down. In Paul's case, we have clues. It's not, it doesn't come right out and say it, but we have clues that Paul had very severely limited eyesight. He had trouble with his eyes. Because um, in two places, he says, you know, and I send you my greetings, and you know, here you can tell from my own handwriting. And in one place, he says, and you can tell it's mine because of the big letters I'm writing in. So there was an indication that his eyes were really bad, so the likelihood of him being able to write all of that letter would have been very, very difficult. Um, so yeah, they had secretaries, but those secretaries were, in those days, in the same way that stenographers today are trained to completely accurately capture, so much so that it's considered legally viable, you know, stenographer, a court stenographer, it's considered that whatever they capture is what was said. People don't question that. In the same way, in those days, I mean, UNCs and scribes that they were called in the Old Testament and New Testament as well, um, they were more the, the system, you know, they, they belonged to the system of the religion rather than just a personal secretary like, like some of these other folks. Um, that was their job. They were trained in it. They were good at it. And so the idea of being of, them, of Paul or John or any of the others dictating their message to someone and having them write it down for them and sometimes then copying it, there's no indication in that that that's in any way negative. That was the way it was done in that in the world at that time. Um, and until everybody and their brother had a word processor on their desk, which has only happened in the last 10 or 12 years, um, the same thing happened I mean, when I was at World Vision 25 years ago. We had a word processing center. And I would we'd pick up the phone and we would dictate our letters and memos and stuff. And then an hour later, they would deliver it for us to make sure that it was accurate. We do the same things. Okay. 
Uh, I want to get into one other thing now. I want to talk about, and I'm not sure, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this slide first. I want to talk about textual criticism and translation, and then I will talk about the reliability of what we have. Okay? Let me reorganize that for a second. Textual criticism, what used to be called lower criticism, to differentiate it from higher criticism, lower criticism describes um, textual criticism, the idea of comparing ancient versions of texts to try to determine the best, the closest to the original copy. Um, whereas higher criticism is the effort to establish authorship, date, place of composition. Higher criticism is the area that's gotten us into all kinds of trouble because of you know, some of the directions that the German higher critics have gone. Uh, that Moses never wrote anything, the, you know, the New Testament writings were 250 years after Jesus and on and on and on. Uh, stuff that most legitimate scholars nowadays say, absolutely not. But textual criticism, the basic problem. This is a quote by Paul Max, who's a textual critic. We have no autograph manuscripts. An autograph is the original, the first one. Like when you sign your name, it's an autograph. An autograph is the, the one the person actually wrote. We have no autograph manuscripts of the Greek and Roman classical writers, and no copies which have been collated with the originals, meaning we don't have copies that you actually had the original to compare it to. The manuscripts we possess derive from the originals through an unknown number of intermediate copies and are consequently of questionable trustworthiness. The business of textual criticism is to produce a text as close as possible to the original, which is called a constitutio, a constitutio textus. Um, so, the textual critic's ultimate objective is the production of a critical edition, a text most closely approximating the original. The uh, in the time when the Bible was written, both Old Testament and New Testament, they clearly didn't have any printing presses. Everything had, was written by hand and everything was copied by hand. Well, the copying issue, the reason we don't have any of the original autographs or original manuscripts is because the material that was used back then was very uh, volatile. It was e easily destroyed. It was either papyrus, which was made out of reeds, which if it got too wet, it rotted. If it got too dry, it crumbled. It was not intended to be to last forever. Or they used what, some version of parchment, which meant an animal skin. Um, the very best parchment, which was lamb skin, was vellum. And they would, they would uh, scrape it and they would um, um, tan it in various ways so that you ended up with uh, material you could write on. But again, it, well that was very expensive, which is one of the reasons they used papyrus more, because it was cheaper. But even parchment was uh, an organic material, and so it was liable to decay as well. I mean, it could, it could get damp, and plus, you write on it with the kind of inks they had then. If it got damp, the stuff ran, and you couldn't read it anymore. Uh, sometimes they would scrape, scrape the old, because it was expensive, scrape the old writing off to use something else on it. So there was not a stable, permanent medium for them to write the stuff to communicate to us. And that meant they would write it on part on papyrus or parchment until it got old and started fading or got crumbled or whatever, and then they would have to copy it again. And so it is a long series. You know, the, the Gutenberg's press was not invented until the 1500s. So until we had movable type printing press, um, the only viable way to maintain these documents was to write them down. Well, there is inherent in any copying process um, the, the tendency to error. Now, um, when I say the tendency to error, it is not a huge tendency to error. Um, the, the work that has been done on the biblical documents. They used, the, liberal, the liberal commentators used to say that, well, you know, what we have now probably has, is nothing like what the original document. I mean, if we had if we had much older documents, then we would we would see that they have been changed completely and blah blah blah. That was what they said until 1947. In 1947, uh, through an accident by a shepherd boy in the Dead Sea area of Israel, they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. The story is that he was chasing one of his goats, and the goat ran to there these uh, mouths of small caves all over that area of the Dead Sea, and he threw a rock at the goat, and it. it skipped into one of these caves and he heard pottery break. And he went in and there were all of these big jars, ceramic jar, pottery jars rather, uh, and they were full of scrolls, ancient parchment scrolls. Well, the Dead Sea area there is very dry. And this stuff had been sealed in these big, these big clay jugs. 
and so it had been preserved. What they ended up with, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are all of the Old Testament with the exception of, uh, portion, at least portions of all the books of the Old Testament, with the exception of Esther, and I think it was one other. And this comes from the time of Jesus. This stuff was preserved by the Essene community, which was a sort of apocalyptic, um, end times kind of uh, Jewish sect in the first century. We have, um, there are multiple copies of Isaiah, multiple copies of the Psalms, you know, some of them. Plus we have documents that they wrote that were part of their, their religious beliefs. Uh, they had a teacher of righteousness and stuff like that. Well, what happened is, when they took these 2,000-year-old versions of Isaiah and other books, and they compared it to what we have today, they discovered there was virtually no difference. That this idea that all of this had been changed over time and what we have today is not reliable, blah, 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 they discovered that there was virtually no errors and, and absolutely no significant errors, no theological differences. If it was, if any errors or changes that had occurred would be like, do you, when you spell doctor, do you spell it out or do you abbreviate it? You know, do you spell color, uh, C-O-L-O-R or O-U-R? I mean, there were things like that, different spellings or minor changes of that kind, but nothing of any consequence. And so, from that point on, no, nobody can any longer say, well, all this stuff has been changed. But that does not mean that there aren't, um, that there have not been changes that have crept in. Nobody questions that the words that we have today in, in the, the Bible, that there have been some editorial errors made. Now, um, yes? Um, those were discovered in... 47? 40, well, actually, they continued to find it for several years, like 47 to 50. The main yeah. ones were found in 47. Now, are they still intact? Well, intact, not all of them were intact yes, then. Sir, they ripped them up and we saw the pieces. Well, there were, some of the, some of the pieces were destroyed early. For the most part, they're still, like, they have the entire, I think, nine or ten copies of the entire book of Isaiah. Um, once people found out what it was and they were taken, uh, for a long time the problem was that the people who had them wouldn't release them. Nobody else could study them or look at them. That's not true anymore. You know, there is the, the, the shrine of the book in Jerusalem now where they have a huge display of them. The photographs of them are available online. Um, so a lot of them, most of them are intact. Um, so, yeah, that's not an issue. Was it one of them written on copper? Yes, there is a copper plate. Uh, where they had engraved it on copper, which was, uh, uh, now you can imagine, they didn't do a lot of that back then because the expense of that, that's much more expensive than parchment, but there is a copy, uh, copper, um, and all of these are scrolls, and, and, you know, they would be, they'd have two rollers, and you sort of unroll one side as you roll up the other, which is a very difficult way to, to go. It wasn't until the second and third centuries that they began to introduce codexes. A codex is what we think of as a book where you've got, you've got sheets of papyrus or parchment and you write on both sides and then you take the next one and write on both sides and when you've got a bunch of them you sew them together at the edge so that you can flip them over. That's called a codex. The original books as we know. Could, could you actually take your scroll and go like this? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different kind of scroll in. He's thinking of a tablet. But um, um, and tablets were even harder. because. <laughs> Uh, it lasts forever. And, and that's why, and those are that's still, scrolls are still the traditional way that the Hebrew um, uh, documents are held. There will be a, uh, an ark, it's called, in a Jewish synagogue. And that's where they keep the scrolls. And they have these beautifully uh, embroidered covers for the scrolls of the law and things. And they will, sort of a ceremonial thing, they'll bring them out and walk them around, you know, in, in services. And then take the cover off and lay them out, depending upon which scroll they're reading from, and that's what they will read from for services in synagogues. And they still use that. And they'll, they'll have a little, a little sort of uh, tray kind of thing that has um, sort of roller guides on it. And so you you literally do this because the the rollers are edged, and you can roll the scroll through. The reason why later on they ended up having first and second kings instead of kings being one book is because there's only so many so much information you can put on one of those scrolls before the tendency to tear it happens. Mm -hmm. And so while the Hebrews still think of them as one book, after a while they said it makes a whole lot more sense on some of this stuff to break it up into smaller pieces. So that's why they did that. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about textual criticism and we'll take a break. Textual criticism is is a branch of scholarship that invol involves a whole lot of different things. Um, and over the years, they have developed uh, what they call canons of textual criticism, which mean they're guides that have rules 
that can be followed in terms of trying to decide what is the best text we have. Which one is more accurate? You've got two ancient texts, maybe a hundred years apart, of the Gospel of Mark, for instance. And there is a slight difference in wording in a certain place. And I'm going to talk about, in, in, when we come back, the kinds of errors that occur. But how do you decide which one is more, is more likely correct? If you don't know, well, you can compare it to others. And if you've got three that say one thing and then one that says something else, then the, the, the likelihood is that the three that are the same are more accurate. Right? Makes sense. There are other rules uh, that they follow. For instance, one principle is that the harder reading is to be preferred. Because very seldom did any, any scribe go in and complicate something. If anything, they try to simplify it. It's more likely they'll remove something than add something in from a probability point of view. So the simpler or, and or the harder is more likely the more accurate one. The shorter reading is usually better. Uh, the, a reading is less likely to be the original if it's clear that an effort's been made to smooth away some difficulties. If there's something in there that's rough, that, that, you know, you're, it's more likely to be the original because that means somebody hasn't gone in to try to clean it up. Um, there are a lot of things like that that they follow in terms of rules that, that are thought to make sense in terms of interpreting. But ultimately, it comes back to um, what the quality uh, and the number of documents they have that are consistent. Um, I'm going to leave you hanging in terms of the kind of errors that come in, and then we'll take a break and come back. So, no one questions that the current text that we have of the Bible have had scribal errors involved. Um, but having said that, before anybody panics, even people who are really strict, you know, fundamentalist inerrantists don't doubt that. We'll talk about what inerrancy actually means in a few minutes. But the, I would start out by saying that with regard to errors in the text, um, estimates are that the current text that we have, because we have so many documents from that period that they've been able to compare, plus we have the writings of the early church fathers in the first few centuries where they quoted there are 86,000 quotes just of the New Testament in the writings of the early church fathers. So we've got all, all of this resource material that we can kind of cross-reference to determine. And so um, it, it is pretty much universally accepted that the texts we have now, uh, the New Testament particularly, the Old Testament is probably even more solid because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the New Testament is somewhere between 96 and 99% certain that that is the original text. And any variants that fall outside that 96 to 99 percent certainty are are not of any theological consequence. There's not, you know, it doesn't change any doctrine. It doesn't have any theological impact on anything. So, for that reason, we are sure beyond any any reasonable doubt that the text that we have of the New Testament is accurate to what was originally written, even though the particular bird, the particular text that we have may have an error. We got enough stuff to compare that what we have in our modern translation, we believe, is solid. Now, I want to go through the kinds of errors that occur in Scripture. Yes? Do we happen to know <coughs> the oldest New Testament document manuscript? The oldest New Testament document is, uh, we have a fragment of the Gospel of John from the first century, mm -hmm. and then we have a fairly complete New Testament, uh, well, the Gospels, from mm -hmm. early second century. And I'm going to get into that dating in a minute, because the number of sources that you have and the, the nearness of those sources to the original are the two factors that determine the veracity, you know, how reliable is it. And the New Testament exceeds 20-fold any other ancient writing. And I'll show you that in a minute. Yes? Yeah. And I saw this on the internet, so take it. So it must be true. But, yeah. <laughs> they... Uh, in Egypt, the uh, the royalty used gold face right. masks. Uh, the the less uh, wealthy people people use layers of papyrus. Right. And, and I found that. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Was it was it the Gospel of Matthew? I can't remember which one. It was. I think it was. Was it Matthew? I think it was Matthew. Yeah. But, uh, through an X-ray technique. Yeah. And uh, and that. They they felt it would have been a first century document. Yep. Mm. So they're still they're still verifying that. But yeah, that's the, the, um, they're still finding stuff. That's one of the other things is we're still finding things. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
remember a story, I don't remember who the gentleman was, but he was a, a known scholar who was an atheist and decided to try and prove that all this was uh, hooey and uh, actually became a Christian because of, there was so much evidence that he uh, couldn't possibly uh, right. deny it. Well, there have been quite a few people like that. <laughs> Lee Strobel is a popular one today, who was a journalist who went out and who sought to disprove. Josh McDowell uh, made an effort to disprove the truth of the gospel and became a Christian and an apologist because of that. And um, there are quite a few others that that's been the story, that they once you really take it seriously and really study it, the evidence is, is in our favor, okay? But let's talk about the kind of textual errors that creep in so that you've got some idea of what we're talking about. When we say there are errors in the New Testament text, we start to panic. That's why I started out by saying that what we have is between between 96 and 99 percent accurate based upon all the sources. But in any given text, there may be certain kinds of errors. That is, any any one given copy that a scribe copy. 95 percent of all of them, of all of those textual variants, are unintentional errors. They're just a slip. It's a mistake somebody made. <clears throat> So 95% of it has nothing to do with something, somebody going in. Because an accusation is often made that certain kind of texts are, were intentionally changed for theological reasons or whatever. In fact, last week I said there are certain versions, uh, translations of the Bible that were not reliable. And I said, New Century. That was wrong. And uh, Doug corrected me on that and he was right. I meant the New World version. New Century is a very valid, there is a New Century, it's a very valid translation. The New World Translation, the NWG, is a Jehovah's Witness translation. And they have very plainly adjusted the text to meet their theological th desires. Okay. But 95% of all the textual variants are unintentional. The most common kind are errors of sight. As a scribe would be, um, you know, they would have an original, uh, an earlier text that they were copying. And as they looked from the old one, you know, to their new and the old to the new, and if you've ever done that when you were copying something over, they might miss something. It might be that the ending of a word was uh, was this, and they go over here, when they glance back, three words later was a word with the same ending, and they may have left out the words in between because their eye picked up the wrong thing. It's inevitable when you copy something, you know, imagine sitting all day long every day copying these documents. Um, you get tired, things happen. So errors of sight. In some cases, what they would do is they would have one person dictating to a room full of scribes or, or text uh, writers, uh, the text. You've seen pictures, of, like in monasteries, of somebody reading, and there are eight guys, you know, eight monks at desks. Um, well, it, you might hear something that is different. Um, an example of that would be: I can remember. Do um, you remember the Moody Blues album and song "Nights in White Satin"? I don't know how many years I thought that was K N I G H T. Nights, da da da, and white satin. It's N I G H T. Nights like, you know, day and night. Day and night. That's the kind of errors that can that happen from hearing that we hear the wrong thing or we just misunderstand the word. <coughs> Excuse me. Errors in writing. Sometimes they simply um, wrote down the wrong thing. You know, they they're napping on the job or whatever, and they end up with a mistake. They add a letter, they drop a letter, something of that sort. Um, errors in judgment. Sometimes scribes exercise poor judgment incorporating marginal glosses. A gloss is a sort of small editorial comment that sometimes would be written in the margin. You know, um, and, and it, might, it might be that if a, if a text was difficult to read, then some scholar, some teacher, some abbot might have written a word or two words in the margin of the text as a way to try to help explain what it meant. Well, there were times when unintentionally, these some junior monk who was being taught to, to copy this stuff would see that gloss and think that that was a correction to the script, that you know, an authoritative correction from something else, and they would add it in, when in fact it was just somebody's comment on it. Uh, so those sorts of things sometimes happen. Um, again, 95% of all errors are these kind of unintentional errors, none of which have any theological con consequence, and virtually all of which get filtered out over the process of textual criticism. Now, 5% of errors in textual, textual uh, variants are intentional. That doesn't mean they're malicious, but it just means somebody made a decision to do something. The first of those kinds are revised grammar and spelling. Um, as simple as that, They somebody would <coughs> 
Um, somebody would, language changes over time. And so they would decide that a word is now spelled differently than it was then. Or that a, the way you've heard Old English, hast thou, da, 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 da. well, at some point we stopped talking like that. <clears throat> so at some point in the process, when language and spelling changed, Sometimes scribes would make those changes in order to make it a more modern sound. Well, that, that is technically an error that was intentionally introduced because it's not the way it was originally written. And they were trying to make it better, you know, they were trying to, to update it. Um, there was not a theological malfeasance in that. Yes, Flora? Um, uh, how did we go about changing from these nouns? How did that language evolve to something else? <sighs> I, I don't know that I can describe the process because it happened over a very long period of time, and it's happened in every language. Um, German, you know, um, ancient German. Uh, English had Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. German had Old German, Middle German, and Modern German. Um, I, I've mentioned before that uh, Lu Martin Luther pretty much created Modern German because when he translated, here's an example, he translated from the original Hebrew and Greek text into German. He didn't translate it into the Middle German, which was common in that day. He translated it into Modern German. And in doing so, he sort of firmly established Modern German as being the standard now. And everybody stopped doing that. So we have a few examples of where a major step in the transition was made. But I, my philological training is not sufficient to be able to say exactly when those works. Does anybody else have any insight into that? I mean, language just evolves. Mm -hmm. and, and we begin to say things differently. Um, yes? We can see that in um, immigrants to this country who, um, whether they be Dutch or German or French, whatever, um, they still speak the language, their native language, in the form it was um, pre-war. Mm -hmm. And when they visit their homeland, the people there laugh at them. What yeah. the heck are you saying? But that's what happens to my mother-in-law. Her nieces and nephews said, just be quiet. We can't stand it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have a friend who's a New Zealander, and um, just in terms of accent. And we went back to New Zealand, and he'd lived in the States as a U.S. citizen. He's lived in the States for a long, long time. And we, we stopped in a, in a wine shop, and the guy there said, where are you from? And he said, I'm from here. I'm from I'm a Kiwi. I'm from New Zealand. He said, your accent is all messed up. I thought you were Swiss or something. Yeah, so sometimes it changes in accents affect that. Um, every year they announce the new words that are being added to the Oxford Unabridged Dictionary of the English Language because new words come in. Well, new words come in and old words fall off. People just stop using them. Or they take a word and the meaning changes. Um, and Carolyn and I, some of the ones we know, we're always joking about. You listen to something on TV and go, well, they absolutely decimated them, you know? And we, what does decimate mean? Does anybody know? Reduced them. Nice. But most people think it means kill them all. Decimate means kill one-tenth of them. And the Romans, when they used to punish, you know, if, if a group of soldiers failed in their duty or whatever, they would go down the row and they would count off and every tenth one of them were executed. That was called to decimate their people. Decimate means to kill one-tenth. And yet we've, we've turned it into a word that means everybody, right? right. <laughs> we change the meaning of words. Um, Carol and I laugh about that all the time. We heard some of the other they absolutely decimated them. They go, oh, well, 90% of them are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So revised grammar and spelling. And language just changes over time. Uh, I, I don't have a better answer. I'm sure a Kalala just could give you a better answer than that. But. Secondly, harmonizing similar passages. Because particularly in the Gospels, we have... Um, different passages in the Gospels that may read a little bit differently. From time to time, a copyist who knew those other examples might adjust one a little bit in order to make those harmonize a little bit better. Okay? Uh, it was an intentional change, but not one intended to reflect the theological difference. They're actually trying to make it better. They shouldn't, but they do. Third, uh, eliminating apparent discrepancies and difficulties. This is one, I'll give you an example, in Mark 1, 2 to 3, some of the manuscripts cited that um, Mark is, it says, um, as, as told in the prophets. Other texts say, as told in Isaiah. Well, one of the things the Jews did was the, the books, the major prophets we talked about, they start with the book of Isaiah. And sometimes they'll refer to all of the prophets as the writings of Isaiah. It's sort of a shorthand for saying that group. 
Jesus did, this, did the same thing. He said it's found in the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Because Psalms was the longest and most important book of the writings. So he was actually referring to all three sections of Scripture, not just the book of Psalms. So from time to time, that sort of thing, they would, they would try to clean that up and say, well, you know, Mark didn't really mean Isaiah. What he meant was all of the prophets are writing. Because the quote is not from Isaiah. It's from one of the other major prophets that's being quoted in Mark 1. And so they would make that kind of change. Um, they would conflate the text, which means they might have two different versions of things, and they would push them together, including both variants in the copy, sort of like the Amplified Bible does, you know, where it's got explanations for things. They take multiple kinds of interpretations, and they'll try to get them all in there so you see the whole thing. That's called conflating. Um, adapting different liturgical traditions. This is very rare, but it, in a few places, uh, in some texts, we have cases where they included church liturgy. For, uh, for instance, in Matthew 6, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. That's not actually in the original prayer. But because that became part of the traditional liturgy of the church and everybody heard that, once that was established as part of the standard liturgy of the church, uh, copyists who were going back in and writing that thought, oh, well, well, this is a great part of it, and they left it off, so we'll put that in. All right? But there's no theological content problems. And then finally, and least common of all, is making theological or doctrinal changes. That is either omitting something that they thought might have been wrong or clarifying, uh, putting in clarifying additions. Um, an example of that would be in Matthew 24, 36. Jesus says, uh, no one knows the hour or the day, <clears throat> you know, when the, when the Son will return. Not even the Son, but only the Father in heaven. Well, because of the doctrine of the uh, omniscience of God the Son as well as of the Father, some early copyists had trouble with that, you know, with the Son. There's something the Son doesn't even know, you know, it's the Son of God, maybe. Um, and so there were some texts that took that out because it created problems for them. Well, it's, that change has not existed in any modern translations, all right? So these are the kinds of textual variants. The vast majority of them were slight, accidental. What we have is considered to be unequivocally um, the original, up to a 99% accuracy, and none of that little bit that's left over that we're not absolutely sure about has any consequence in terms of meaning. They're just little misspellings that we're not sure. You know, was it spelled C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R? We're not sure, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Is there a comment? Yes, now, question. A question. The number six up there, does that take into account the, the additions that were made in like 380 at one of these councils or am I seeing You've been councils? reading the wrong stuff. Council of Nicaea did not change the scripture. Okay, in some in some of the uh, translations, they italicize, and we talked about it last week, italicize sections that are added in at right. a later date. Well, that's, that's true. That didn't happen at the Council of Nicaea, though. Yeah, well, okay. where it happened. But does that take that into account? It does. Um, okay. There, any time, and there are several places. One at the end of the Book of Mark. Mm -hmm. There is also the Johannine comma, which is the story about the woman caught in adultery. You know, that they brought her to Jesus and said, you know, what should we do to her? And, and he says, you without sin cast the first stone. Um, there are several places like that where there are passages. And I, I didn't mean to jump on you. I'm sorry no, to sound no, that no, way. I realized okay. I said that too strongly. Um, the, some people say, well, the Council of Nicaea or other councils went in and made changes, political changes. They didn't. That didn't happen there. We have, in, like in some of the ancient, when we look at the most ancient documents we have, the Codex, Codex Sinaiticus, the Codex Alexandrinus, the Codex Vaticanus, and then other fragments, some of the Syriac translations, which happened very early on, even before some of our Greek texts, um, there are a few places where we have a section that appears in some of them, doesn't appear in others. You know, there are just three or four of those. Uh, the, as I say, the, the, the end of the book of Mark where it says, you know, and the, the believers will drink poison, they will take up poisonous snakes, you know, and not be harmed, etc. Um, we don't have any evidence that that absolutely wasn't in there, but some of the early texts don't have it. And so the good translations, almost all of the translations you'll pick up today, will include that, but they'll be italicized, uh, or at the very least, there'll be a note, and they'll set it aside, and there'll be a comment saying some of the earliest manuscripts do not contain verses 14 to 27. Okay. 
But that's not that somebody intentionally went in and did that, because if we know that a change like that was made, then that's not included. It's just when we have some of the most ancient texts have a passage like that, and some of the others don't, and there's no other evidence to tell us either by, by what it says or by, you know, the part about um, drinking poison and taking up snakes and not be harmed and all that, that is the foundation for some of the Pentecostal snake handling cults, like Church of God Anderson, Tennessee. Um, and they, that's really all the, that and the fact that Paul got bitten by a snake that crawled out of the fire, but he didn't do it on purpose. And, and Paul didn't, the snake did. Um, and so some people have really gone off the deep end on those, and those are not verified as being absolute, but we don't know for sure. And so they're included with a footnote. Yes? So from my understanding, you're saying that that was just sort of the last, last verse of Mark? Well, it's the last section. The last Mark. section, because yeah. verse there's several verses. 16, uh, 17, and 18 deals with the with um, poisons and and they shine. Right. I don't I don't have my Bible with me. Somebody got a Bible handy? Turn to the end of the book of Mark. That they'll be no void and harmless. Yeah. Oh, you don't. Mark one. Um, the very end of the chapter of Mark of the book of Mark, rather. Um, and it, in any good translation. Worth its salt will say some ancient manuscripts do not include. So I'm testing the theory here. Unless you've got the New World Translation. <laughs> um, do you see it? Yeah, right, actually. Verses 17 and 18. Yeah. What does it say? I mean, yeah. the, the comment yeah. on it, not the. the my footnote says here that uh, uh, the earliest manuscripts of the Book of Mark in here. The longer ending was added in the 5th century. Okay. And that was at uh, verse 8. Okay. It's so the that, whole last part of that chapter. Right. Now, again, usually what they'll say is some of the earliest manuscripts do not include this. I've, I've not read it. Not, I was not familiar. Maybe I just missed it. That they, they go to their specific as saying it's the 5th century. What that means is that they have a 5th century text that has it in it and they didn't find it in some earlier ones. Right. And so. there's another note here that there's, there's a shorter ending, shorter added ending, a longer ending. And then uh, his appearance to the twelve disciples in the Great Commission. But the, the shorter ending was added to a manuscript B, an Alexandrian manuscript from Egypt in the fifth century. Okay. And the longer ending was added to manuscript uh, A, a Byzantine manuscript from Syria, Asia, wow. in the fourth century. Okay. So, in fact, is that King James or, or New King James? This no. This is the one one new man. It's the what? It's the One New Man Bible. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Um, well, the fact that they make a point of the Alexandrian, Alexandrian text versus the Byzantine text um, is, I thought it might be King James or New King James. It, it, it sounds like it's still one that's based upon the Texas Receptus. And this article, which I'm not going to get into today, but I wasn't going to talk about next week, but I want to give you a chance to read it. Is your modern translation corrupt? This is a really good article that addresses that King James only thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the accusations that King James only folks make is that all but the King James or the New King James are based upon uh, Alexandrian or uh, text from the school of Alexandrinus, you know, from Alexandria. And that that's not as good a text and that it's been, it's been theologically changed. That's not true. It's not accurate. This article will address that. Don't and read it right now because I have more to say. Yes. And we'll put a link to that article online. Good. We'll put a link online. So, um, and it, it, this article is a very scholarly but easy to read article that tells you why that isn't valid. And why modern translations from New American Standard Version, NIV, the Holman, the English Standard Version, and on and on, that the, the newer translations are much more accurate than the King James. I love the King James. I, I most When I quote scripture half the time, I'm quoting the King James still. But King James, in the 1600s, when the King James translation was done, they simply did not have access to virtually all of the really important ancient documents. They didn't have Sinaiticus or Vaticanus or Alexandrinus or any of those things. And so we have much earlier, much more reliable documents now uh, in, in terms of the ancient text than they had when they did King James Version. It's simple as that. And some of what you read in King James is not a good translation. Um, even though they did the best they could. They actually were basing 
and on some of the writings of Erasmus and others, what had came to be known as the Textus, Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, and the King James only folks, the people who advocate that the King James is the only valid translation, or the New King James, they'll sort of get you, um, is because they believe all these other changes came into it, and the Textus Receptus was received by God. I'm sorry, but there's nothing academically to support that. So read the article, and we'll talk about that next week, all right? Um, I thought you all would be especially interested in that. Um, so, how reliable is our Bible, especially New Testament? The Old Testament, you know, we actually have more from the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatnot. There currently are uh, 5,686 Greek New Testament manuscripts in existence, meaning they are handwritten manuscripts. A manuscript is, they're not printed. This is back in the day, it means they're ancient. They're documents from antiquity. Compared to other ancient writings, the New Testament manuscripts far outweigh the others in quantity and in accuracy. The two things that give us give credibility to the accuracy of any ancient document is how many different versions of it do we have that we can compare. Again, you've got ten things to look at and, and, and compare. You've got more likelihood of figuring out which, what's really accurate than if you have two. So the number of ancient texts is important. And also, how close are those texts to the original document? Because the longer you go, the more likelihood that there's going to be changes that creep in, right? You've all played the game of telephone, where you sit in a circle, one person whispers something to the person next to them, and they whisper it all the way around. The bigger the circle is, the more different the end that's going to come out the other end. If you've got two people, it's not likely to change very much. All right. So, to give you a comparison, um, and, and this says 18 of the manuscripts are from the 2nd century, one from the 1st century, it's possible that that new papyri of one of the Gospels that they found in, the, in one of the masks uh, in ancient Egypt, from ancient Egypt, may be one of the earliest texts we have. But the writings of um, Pliny, of Plato, of Demosthenes, Thucydides, Euripides, Aristophanes, Caesar Augustus, uh, Julius Caesar, the wars, Tacitus, Aristotle, Sophocles. You'll notice that the date they were written, the earliest copy, the time gap to copy, that fourth column over, 750 years means the earliest copy we have, how much after the actual writing of the document was that? 750 years in the case of Pliny. Um, Plato, 1,200 years. Demosthenes, 800 years. Thucydides, 1,300 years. Euripides, 1,300 years. Now, Aristophanes, uh, 1,200 years. These are major people, by the way. If you don't recognize the names, these are some of the most important Greek, and in some cases, Roman writers. Um, Aristophanes, 1,200 years. Julius Caesar, his, his, uh, the wars, histories of Caesar, 1,000 years later. 1,000 years of Tephetasmus, 1,400 years for Aristotle, between when he wrote it and the, er, the earliest copy we have. 1,400 years for Sophocles. Homer's Iliad is the best attested ancient document we have in terms of the number of ancient texts we have to verify it. And there are... Um, the earliest we have is 500 years after Homer, and we have 643 of those documents. They're thought to be 95% accurate. And you'll notice in terms of number of copies, Pliny, we have seven ancient copies. Seven for Plato, eight for Demosthenes, etc., 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 and this, in, this goes in descending order. So the, the most, other than the Bible, the most uh, verifiable ancient document we have is Homer's Iliad. We have 643 texts. The closest to the writing is 500 years later. That's the earliest. The Bible, we have 5,686 ancient texts. And the earliest is less than 100 years after the original writing. Do you see why we say the Bible, the New Testament especially, is the most attested, the most verified, the most accurate ancient document that exists? That make sense? You understand? That reasoning? Um, there is simply no reason. And that's why they can say, we believe, you know, this says 99.5. Different, different scholars will say from 96 to 99% accurate. But still, even over the Iliad, by far the most accurate text consistent with the originals of any ancient document. So don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, that's all been changed and, you know, we don't know what's there and everything else. Okay? Uh, the Old Testament's not there. I imagine that's because the Jews had many copies of that. 
alone. Well, they did, and not only that, but um, the, people don't challenge the Old Testament writings as much. That's part of it. Um, the Old Testament writings, there was much more of a consistency of uh, lineage in the Jewish traditions. The Jews have always had schools. There's always been scholarship. They've always had versions of the Bible. Every example that we have comparing the most ancient text to more modern text um, have demonstrated that the Jewish copyists were very meticulous. When I say that, they counted every character, every word, and every line in every document. When a copyist copied a page of the Old Testament, you know, a Hebrew writer or a, a copyist, then there would be several other people who would count the characters on that page, and they knew how many characters were supposed to be on that page, and if it didn't line up, they buried that script, that document. The Old Testament was considered holy to the point that they never burned it or destroyed it. They would give it a burial, literally. When you read um, in the time of Josiah in the Old Testament, they say that they were remodeling the temple, and they found a copy of the law, and you're going, what is that? Somebody put it inside the walls or something? Well, because the Jews held the, held the Torah, the law, in such value that when it, one got too old to use, you know, it started getting the edges torn or whatever, they literally would bury it. And in the temple, there was a special room, which was sort of a tomb for the old copies of the Torah. And it's likely that that had been closed off, and then they reopened it when they were remodeling, and they found this copy of Deuteronomy which is what we believe that that, that was in Josiah's time. So, um, they, but they were absolutely meticulous about that. And that was demonstrated by the fact that when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, 2,000 years before what we have now was when they were written.